Okay. I'm broadcasting to all attendees. Okay, I'm enjoying. Hello. Hi, Darren. Hello. How are you? Yeah, I'm very good, thanks. How are you? Very good. Very much looking forward to this discussion. I think it will be, be a fantastic one. We have, uh, we have lots of participants in as well, so that's great. Hi, Alison. Hi. Hi. Right. Uh, okay, let's, let's kick off then. Um, firstly, brief introduction to this event and why we're hosting it. Uh, I'm Mark, Mark Storm from the Young Fabians Technology Network, and we are uh, part of the Fabian Society, uh, left wing think tank, the oldest one in the UK. And today we're having a roundtable discussion with uh, Darren Jones, MP, and with Alan Zagorno, who is a professor or a lecturer at. Lecture. Um, <laughs> soon Thanks to be the professor uh, in AI and AI ethics. And Darren Jones, MP, of course, is, as well as being the MP for Bristol Northwest, he is also uh, the chair of the Bay Select Committee and has, um, has roles in international bodies on AI as well. So fantastic panel today and very excited to kick off this discussion. So for those of us uh, who aren't as familiar with Industry 4.0, um, I'd like to ask a question, introductory question to you both. So what is it to you? What is Industry 4.0? Uh, what does it mean? And uh, then what are the government doing about it? How have they reacted? And do you think what they're doing is, is good? Is it, could it be better? Darren, why don't you start? Sure, uh, very good. Uh, well, look, um, thank you, Marcus, um, for inviting me today. Uh, and it's great to be here for uh, what I understand is a joint Labour Digital um, and Young Fabians um, uh, tech event. And I hope there'll be more of that type of collaboration in the future, uh, because here in uh, Westminster, we always benefit from having these debates and these insights and also the ideas that you and your colleagues uh, generate. Um, and uh, certainly as the, as the chair of Labour Digital, but also as the um, chair of the Backbench DCMS Committee and a member of the National Policy Forum in the Labour Party, I hope to be able to continue to have these discussions with you so we can try and feed that into the party's um, policy process over the coming years ahead. Uh, to answer your question on the fourth industrial revolution, um, what is it? Uh, what is the government doing about it? And is it good enough? Um, I, I'm not going to kind of venture into a definition and maybe Alison has one that's actually industry recognised on the fourth industrial revolution, but uh, my, my, my view is basically it's where our economy is digitised and connected. Uh, and so we're using technology and data and connectivity in a way um, that changes the way that we work in our private sector, the way that we deliver public services, the way we tackle policy challenges like climate change. And, you know, we've started to see some of this accelerate through the pandemic, the very fact we're having this conversation like this and not across the road in a committee room in the House of Commons shows that, you know, we're changing the way that we um, operate. Uh, what is the government doing about that? So the government has an industrial strategy. Uh, it's here. Um, and there's something in this that talks about um, uh, digitizing industry in the fourth industrial revolution. Um, to answer your question, do I think the government's doing a good enough job uh, uh, with that? Um, I don't. Um, my committee is currently having an inquiry uh, on post-pandemic economic growth and in a couple of weeks we'll be launching a review of the industrial strategy um, and seeing what we think the government ought to do about it in the future. And I've, I've long been an advocate for technology adoption and digitization. I think we need to do that as part of our economic growth strategy to improve productivity, to improve profits, to improve rate wages, to reduce the cost of public services. But the government has a really important role to play in kind of stabilizing that transition. So where work is changing maybe more quickly, making sure the state's there to help workers transition in a just way. I'm thinking about some of the 
um, application of existing laws like you know civil liberties or data protection um, or, or, or freedom from speech or kind of um, ethical considerations, making sure that those are applied and enforced in a way that makes sense in that kind of modern digital environment. Um, and maybe at that point, it's a good opportunity to hear Alison's view, which is probably more coherent than mine. So over to you, Alison. No, I think it's a fair point. I, I'm just trying to try hard not to be too political about this, but I would, some will argue by the way that it's the fifth industrial revolution, but that's an, another, another matter. But it, it's, it's this preponderance of data and this data driven society, which they're very, very keen on. And it's mentioned within the industrial strategy. And I'm really concerned about that because data is only good as what we choose to collect and what value judgments we make upon those, those connections. So um, this drive towards this data driven is, is in many ways, it's not well thought of, but you, you see discussed in the um in in the sort of ethos about data being the new oil or the new gold um and that basically i sort of view us as it, it's we're being farmed for our data and whether it, this is a, a strategy that is for the benefit of the individual in society rather than to benefit um uh, you know the current corporate structures um and systems that are in place to further enhance their power and their and their wealth is is a real issue and when you read it from that perspective it really does concern me um it, it doesn't it doesn't read as a, a healthy government strategy at all it reads like a manifesto i'm afraid i mean it's in the, you know sort of blurbs such as you know we've got the best employment ratios you know and it's incredible you know more employment than ever before well, we all know that is is about zero hours and and um you know that 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 type of economy that we have um oh what's the phrase darren it begins with g i was gone it's the gig economy the gig economy thank yeah. you and and some of you know the uh, you know advantages of 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 technology has allowed that to exist which could advantage people to have flexible learning but we have seen now that it's been co-opted and and has not actually advantaged the individual at all so i'm a bit dubious about that there's plenty of good stuff in it um i do agree that we need to think about technology and education in technology you know we are no longer the four r's or the three r's you know there is a fourth r which you know writing what is it writing reading arithmetic and now i suppose we have to say rogue Programming instead of programming but you know that is the, the fourth yeah. skill and it is really important that we educate on that and I lead on oh sorry I didn't introduce myself but I I'm a lecturer at Keele University and founder of um, women leading in AI um, and I speak um, sort of internationally on the issues of the problems with lack of data diversity and the impact of badly designed AI if we're not careful and inequalities that can be embedded. Um, but I also lead an apprenticeship programme in data science at Keele and the advantages that that has is quite, quite amazing. So I don't want to panic. Um, there's a lot of good stuff in there. Um, but it, it, there's a lot of issues. So, you know, the, the sector deal is quite interesting, but it leaves mm. out things like the care sector. It's 23 billion you know in 2016 it was it was producing that economic benefit so you know the focus also is is, is an interesting one thank you very much there. yeah so how i want this discussion to be driven is i'm going to ask a couple of introductory questions to spur your thoughts as in everybody in the audience i want you to be thinking critically about this issue even if you don't think you you know a lot but um this discussion will help you help you consider some of those issues. And please use the Q&A function down below in the chat. So ask questions anytime you want and we'll bring you in. I'll ask you to uh, speak and ask your question to the panelists if the, the question is, is uh, coming up and you can vote on other people's questions as well. So uh, please ask as many questions as you want. Start from now. <laughs> so the second question is around the future of work. So I want us to think a little bit about what that means physically for our environment. So we have a problem with, um, I guess you call it industrial decline, where we have communities in certain parts of the country who sprung up around industrial uh, areas and they, they, they were um, they were for certain purposes and that was quite suddenly uh, wrested away from them 
especially in the 80s uh, during the Thatcher reforms. And that's been a large issue for uh, lots of people um, ever since. Uh, what does the fourth industrial revolution mean for those small towns? Is there any way for us to arrest that decline and turn them back into vibrant communities? That, that, and if not, then what, what can we do about it? Do you want to go first, Alison? Do you, do you want me to go first or you? Alison, you you've got it. Okay, right. Um, I did mention also I'm a district councillor um, uh, for Newcastle and Lyme, which is just next door to Stoke. So I'm in a sort of a classic sort of area um, where we were next mining, um, ex potteries, and we've seen an industrial decline. So it is something that's quite close to my heart. Um, I think there's great potential to to address those communities if we are sensible about how we develop our strategies um, so transport strategies are really important and how we plan those realistically um, and one thing i will always stress in everything i say is that we need to think from this from a gender specific point of view because a lot of these planning issues leave out the the, the real life aspect of, of women and so when we're rebuilding society particularly after crisis this often gets um forgotten and there's a classic example which is in Caroline Creator Perez's book which is when they after I, I think there was a um, I think it might have been after the the great tsunami um, mm -hmm. correct me if I'm wrong where they did all this rebuilding of these poor areas which was fantastic and all this planning went in and they forgot to build the houses with that with kitchens you would not believe it but it's true and that actually error has been repeated over and over again so i worry particularly with the industrial strategy that we have this top down sort of very centrist point of view as to how that development should be but we're actually repeating the same mistakes that we've done in the past and we're not thinking more more radically about how we can change how we do so if we're looking for a different different transport strategy let's really think about that and see how how we can develop that but also um i, I have an irish background and uh, the west coast of ireland used to be a very poor poor place um, but they twigged quite early on about the digital revolution and they became these sort of external things so you have apple and and people who are running these great big centers there digitally and people were working for the west of ireland from there and it, and it re, revigorated that, that, that quite rural and isolated uh, location. So we should be thinking about this, but when we do, I mean, job creation, I'll be very quick because I do talk about this. Um, an example where I have, is I have this huge area, uh, Chatterley Valley, which we've been trying to get to build into an industrial zone. And my big fear is, is that they will just slap along that a whole load of warehouses. And we know that that can be fully automated. You have very little work related skill, you know, work there. It will not regenerate the, the, the community as it should. Um, it actually has a rail line going into it. Um, so the idea of a really good quality green manufacturing industry we could bring into there, but we need the radical vision and insight to do that. And at the moment, I still see that lacking. Um, and, and we need to really push it from a local government point of view that, that, we, that these regions fight for this and that we can encourage that connectivity um, around to these these odd areas of, of the country that do get overlooked and from the big metropolitan areas. Yeah. In terms of just a few thoughts on, on, on the question, I mean, the, the kind of Thatcher de deindustrialization was a was a proactive policy decision by government to deindustrialize, which is kind of a bit different to what we're having now in the, you know, technology is, um, uh, you know, having an impact on the way we produce things. Um, uh, uh, and that's had a, um, a, an earlier impact on goods production, but it's now starting to have an impact on services production. So if you take goods production, you know, in my constituency in Bristol Northwest, we've been make, making aeroplanes ever since aeroplanes have existed. And obviously they're particularly hit right now because of the pandemic and the lack of support from the government for the manufacturing sector. But, you know, you'll have seen already the kind of transition from when you might have had 10 or 15, um, you know, workers with kind of widgets and kind of tools kind of putting these things together you now go in and there are these kind of robotic arms kind of doing things and the type of work you do is different, but also you need less people for less time in order to produce the same output. And so you started to see that kind of, uh, that transition into automation already. Um, 
and in the services industry, especially with um, machine learning and artificial intelligence and um, and these types of applications, you're going to start seeing the same thing in my view in the services industry. Now, I'm a lawyer by training. Um, you know, as a junior lawyer, I'd be given enormous contracts to read and kind of go through with a red pen and like find the bits that didn't look right and think about the risk assessment and kind of write that up for my clients and then negotiate how you kind of, you know, there are systems that do this now, especially on what's called boilerplate clauses, where they're always largely written the same way. And you can kind of automate this process. And that's a classic example you know, one of the professions, which for a long time, we've all been like, you know, if you're a lawyer or a doctor or so on and so forth, you're in a pretty kind of secure position. That's just not going to be true anymore. And so that begs the question, uh, what direction do you go in? Do you say, well, actually, this is all a bit scary. Um, so maybe we shouldn't be adopting technology. My argument is that's the kind of Luddite argument, right? And actually, you can't stop it from happening. Um, or do you say, you've got to com completely reimagine what the social contract is. You know, what's the purpose of work? How long do we work for? How do you pay? How do you ensure that the distribution between capital and ownership and labor is, is kind of managed in the right way? Uh, looking at monopolization and kind of um, uh, power of those that own data and the kind of software, the machine learning algorithms, the technologies that provide these services. How should governments kind of um, make sure that that space is balanced in the right way so that you have a capitalist system, which of course I support, but it is regulated to work in the interests of public policy and people. And I just don't think we've actually even got into that conversation properly yet in our democratic um, discourse about, um, about that. There's a bit of stuff around UBI in the four day week and you know, there are some themes coming through. Uh, and there are some people like the Institute for the Future of Work that are doing really you know, significant thinking on this. But certainly here in Parliament, where I am now, I really don't think we've started to think about that kind of what does the future of labour, small l, look like? And how does the kind of tax and regulatory system fit around that so that you can accelerate this adoption of technology to improve productivity and economic growth and hopefully wages and wealth? But also, as I said at the very beginning, make sure the stabilizers are put in place so you're not ruining people's livelihoods in the process. Mm. Can I jump in there on that one? Because it's touched on some quite interesting points. And again, it's why I, I, I worry. And there is issues about whether we should tax algorithms, <laughs> which would be interesting. But it, it's this idea of work and skills. And, and I do see a lot of the strategy is about efficiencies and that and, the, and that we're sold this idea that we could have we could work less and have a better quality of life. Well, my question always is, is that yes we could only work a four day week but the but the companies will not pay us five days exactly. worth of wage they'll pay yeah. us for four days and this is where we're getting with the gig economy and the zero hours so this 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 spin that we're seeing is actually not very very accurate and so i worry about that i also worry about long-term skills and this is this is something that we need to think and i see this a lot in the health tech and a lot of concern about this and this is also something that's highlighted in the aviation industry quite a lot who have been automated and have dealt with automation for actually decades so they're really experienced in this and you what you get is you get a loss of skills so as as an individual has become dependent on these systems and we can talk later about how accurate they are because they they are not they they are extremely faulty and they are not as accurate as we like and i can give you a whole load of information um, and data and examples and case studies on that if you want but there is this issue of loss of skills um and, and the example that you will get is you know we darren you're young i'm older than you but I remember when calculators and spell check came in and everything was great about those, but we see a loss of skills in terms of mental arithmetic and spelling skill because of those. You do de-skill. The same with the aviation industry. There's a real concern that when you qualify as a pilot, it's a number of hours, but the vast majority of the hours you spend as a pilot is, is actually in the autopilot. And what they're discovering is, is that the pilots now becoming de-skilled. So when you have an unusual situation, a crisis situation, we have lost that power and that skills there. And, and we now see that crisis can happen across the, uh, the way. And so we need to build in protections in which if we are looking for an automated industry and, and sector, that we ensure that we do not lose those skills and we do not lose the jobs. It's there to augment jobs, not replace them. Well, we've got a question from Carolina on uh, when we're talking about industrialization or the next wave of industrialization. Carolina, you are um, live, so you can unmute yourself and ask a question. 
Hi, everyone. Um, thank you both so much. It's really, really interesting. Um, can you hear me okay, by the way? Yes. Nothing. Um, I was just wondering, as a very broad strategy, um, especially thinking post-Brexit next January, do we think the UK needs to start um, focusing and investing in domestic manufacturing uh, in order to fight some of the reliance that we have now on European markets? Or do we go very aggressively towards a more global approach to, to trade? That is, you know, trying to get free trade agreements with as many uh, countries as possible, even if that involves lower standards, lower quality of work for, for British workers, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Mm. Well, look, Carolina, this is a, a really important um, area of policy debate right now, and it's 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 quite multifaceted. So, uh, the government has announced um, uh, a new piece of primary legislation called the Investment and National Security Bill, uh, which will we understand we've not seen the drafting yet, but it will expand the powers for government to intervene in supply chains, and to say that where there are goods or services that the government deems are relevant to um uh, uh i mean that's quite lovely Alison. sorry <laughs> i mean i'm a fan i mean maybe marcus can get on the piano in the background there and we i could yeah. stop and we, between us would be all right um right. so the national security and investment bill uh, so where the government has concerns around national security they'll be able to intervene in, in supply chains and obviously there's a huge geopolitical debate going on at the moment about primarily china and the west uh, and kind of how that um, is going to operate in the future. Um, and the government is currently doing something called Project Defend, uh, which is a review of supply chains, including on manufacturing, to say actually where are we, which countries are we dependent on for, for goods, especially where they relate to critical national infrastructure, where we maybe need to think about this. So all of this is up in the air right now, at the same time as the government really deprioritizing its Brexit negotiations and prioritizing its US negotiations, even though we know the US trade deal isn't really going to add much value and actually risks under, undermining British, British production. My particular view is that we absolutely should be investing in British manufacturing. In the last decade, uh, we've not added anything new to our export baskets beyond leather goods and goat, uh, bovine and sheep fat or something. Um, now, I'm a vegan, so I have a particular issue against that, but I, you know, in theory, fine. But it's a very small market. It doesn't really generate much wealth or jobs. There are things that we could be producing in the UK, which we haven't been for a long time because the government, and to be fair, successive governments, have kind of left the international trade bit to Brussels. Well, now that's coming back to us. We've got to be much more uh, proactive on that. And the last thing I would say, because this is related to globalization and it doesn't get raised enough, I don't think, is that when we think about kind of British manufacturing and British jobs and reshoring supply chains, you know, in some way there may be merits around some of that. Um, but we know that trade and free trade uh, within kind of the framework of human rights and environmental protections and stuff is important as well for geopolitical kind of peace. And I'm really concerned about the kind of tensions going on at the moment, how those might translate into more um, uh, kind of defense or national security related tensions, not in kind of invading each other's countries, but in terms of cyber attacks and disinformation campaigns and all that other stuff. And the trouble is, is that if you start to lift out your supply chains from developing countries, um, uh, they may not have other industries or work opportunities in their own countries to develop their own economies. And there's very, very few actually wealthy nations like ours compared to the number of developing nations around the world. And so I don't want us to completely turn our back on every country around the world in order to be able to produce everything we want in the UK because I do think that kind of deglobalization um, ignores the role that we have as wealthy nations to try to lift up the entire world through our demand um, and does risk more tension on the national security side. So getting the balance right is going to be really important on this. Interesting. We do have a, uh, a question related by uh, somebody who submitted a question anonymously, so I'll read it out. Um, um, interested in knowing thoughts um, from Darren on intersections of future technologies, automation, loss of skills, and how this ties in with national economic resilience. So is the question is you know, not just from a geopolitical, but you know, economically, how does, how does that impact us? 
Yeah, so I think the, the bit I'll add here, and then see if Alison has anything that she wants to add on this point, um, is the inequality that we see in the labour market. Um, so we know, we, we often in the Labour Party talk about inequality of kind of pay and inequality of um, work rights. Um, we've talked about some of those today. Uh, what we don't often talk about is the inequality of, um, of, of know-how um, or, or kind of the, the skills. Um, and when we talk about technology, we should, we should think about kind of what do we mean by technology? And in my mind, technology uh, is a number of things. It's kind of, um, uh, let me give you an example. Technology is the hardware, right? Um, it's also the, uh, the codes or the software that's kind of programmed into it so that we know how it works and we know how to use it. But then know-how is then knowing what to do with it so that it's productive. So, you, you know, you can share coding and, and, and kind of um, manuals. You can share hardware pretty easily. But sharing know-how is difficult, especially in things like advanced manufacturing or whatever it might be. I have no idea how to code anything, for example. I'm the foggiest idea. Um, and so the question for us and from a labour perspective, and this is an inequality based on cities and towns, but also class and you know, various other angles, is how do you ensure that everybody in the economy has the right skills and training and the right know-how in order to be able to take part in a fair way in the productive economy and to take opportunities that come from you know, work and the future of work that we've been talking about. And that's really hard because it takes a long time for somebody to be comfortable and perfectly able to kind of do stuff. I think, uh, I can't remember who it was, but someone said it takes up 13 years essentially to learn how to do something well. So you can't just kind of do this overnight. And that's why the stuff that Alison was talking about is really, really important. Yes, it's about a national curriculum. It's also about HE and FE, but it's also about lifelong um, training and also training in the workplace and how you transition people from different from one role to another role. And that, and that know-how is a very unequal distribution across the UK. Um, and I think that is a core problem in our, our growth and our productivity. And so if we, this is why this week in Parliament, or maybe it was last week, I was calling on the Chancellor to ensure we had a fiscal stimulus in people as well as infrastructure. Because I do passionately believe that you need to invest a chunk of capital into people's skills and know-how. And if you do invest in, uh, this is what I said in the Chamber yesterday, if you invest in the skills of the British people, you are investing in the interests of the British economy. Uh, and I, I don't think the Tories effort often really kind of understand that. We've got to kind of push that as much as possible. Before, before I hand over to Alison for her thoughts, um, interesting angle here from Simon, who, who says, um, who's talking about this in his question as well. He says, uh, if we make processes more efficient, um, how quickly will that workforce, how, how quickly will the skills go out of date? So if we take that 30 years figure, Darren, um, how will we ever be able to catch up uh, is, is the interesting angle here. Alison? You're on mute, you're on mute. Unmute myself, there we go. It's right. Um, there's a lot there. Uh, so <laughs> try, try and range back. Um, I, can I just reverse to, to talk about manufacturing because I'm quite passionate about this and, 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 and I, I completely believe that we should consider, you know, and build our manufacturing base. I, I totally take on board. I was fascinated by what Dar and Mark, Mark Darren was saying with regards to globalization, deglobalization. Um, but of course, we can all have niche niches, and and what we are really good at is this idea of technical technical excellence of this, you know, this high quality product. We are the great innovators. We struggle as a country from converting that to a fully commercialized and and good sector. So we we are the inventors, and then it gets taken away. So that we need to consider that. Um, you know, we need to also make sure that that is sustainable. Um, sometimes we will say that do we have to have constant economic growth and is that something that the planet can sustain so we need to think about that aspect as well you know our productivity is flatlined between uh, 20, uh, 2010 to about 2015 don't know why don't know what's going on there um, and then it, it started to sneak up of course it, it's dropped back down again um, quite quite significantly and will do so even further but so we've got to get the balance right with that and sustainable goals as, as well but a social point of view um, as, as it's balancing out Darren's con concerns about you know, world peace and managing that type of aspect is when you're looking at local areas and, and, and local communities, once upon a time identified themselves as, as miners, as potters, you know, you know, as 
painters as you know by these skill-based processes um, that's been wiped away and, and so this sense of identity has now been lost within these communities so if we produce the right type of jobs where people are find value in their work and can get identity from their work that is quite important so we still need skilled jobs and so that level of automation we need to be very very careful of and it's also how we use that automation and it, it, it can be so a classic example and you know this idea of efficiency so within healthcare you can get algorithms now that will actually read radi radium x-rays and mri scans and so on and so forth um, uh, really well um, according to the headlines and we do have a shortage nationally of radiographers and, and, and specialists in that area so this just seems to be a nice quick fix um, but actually they're not always that accurate and actually a two view process can be more accurate and you can get algorithms that make decisions based on mad mad criteria a classic one is the hip fracture algorithm that is meant to be an image recognition tool but actually ignores the image and actually makes its prediction based upon the age and the and the type of mobile scanner that's used which we could have guessed why that happened so it's it's getting this done right and the right integration between automation and the workforce and skills development that we need to do but this sense of identity that manufacturing industries give to a community and this, this locus I think we forget about sometimes and I think we need to consider um, that, that reason and I've forgotten the rest of the question. But there's a really interesting point that Alison's raised on a couple of occasions now which is you know the, the new types of jobs that can come out of this stuff so like how do you quality check the output from these new kind of ways of doing things, as well as coding them and making them in the first place? What role should kind of human intervention have, especially around decision making? Um, and how do we define the types of decisions that we're happy to be perhaps automated, um, but maybe need to be explainable um, versus the ones where actually we want to make sure that there's proper human kind of consideration around this? And Europe has been doing or has been starting to do a lot on these issues around human-centered AI and its kind of legislative approach under the Ursula van der Leyen's new um, proposals. And I, I hope the UK continues to play a really kind of engaged role in this debate. I've been a bit disappointed that um, France and Germany, sorry, um, France and Canada have been kind of leading the new international AI work and the UK really ought to be named alongside France and Canada on that. And for whatever reason, uh, the UK is starting to fall a bit behind uh, in terms of international leadership on these issues, which I think is a shame because we have a very strong base um, to, to build from, in my view. And I think all of these kind of uh, points that we've been discussing today um, are linked together. Oh, oh, I'm trying not to get too deep diving into, into um, developing algorithms. <laughs> Again, keeping it at the policy and the political level, but you know, the reason why we're falling behind is that we're not producing ethical AI and, and we're not getting that level of trust. And this is why Canada, for example, with their processes and their algorithmic impact assessment tool that they have from the government level is really, really important. And this idea of human centered design, um, please don't think that algorithms are, are these objective, you know, accurate systems are there. The whole process of developing a, an algorithm, that, for example, a decision making algorithm is human decision making and you hard code in post algorithm the thresholds and the and, and the decision making tools you you hard code in what features you use to process and the weightings that they have and where you get your data from and this data is often historical and often biased in its terms as well like that so there should never be ever automated decision making that is without a meaningful interaction with a human and do not go with gdpr human in the loop thing that is a loophole yeah i agree and, and it's a real important thing that how we do this meaningful human centered ai otherwise we are going to have embedded inequality and and if you look at the algeny child welfare algorithm and issues with regards to that you'll see where the concerns are and that will also go over how you get loss of skills and actually how you can hard code in systems where actually you you, you bypass the human decision making the classic example is the visas 
the visa in, um, in, um, application process that sets the requirement at a 36. They've reduced it now, haven't they? It was 36,000 wage, but they've dropped it down. But it's still yeah. slightly higher than that of a, of a nurse. You know, that is a decision that's made. That's a policy decision that's put into that algorithm. So when the algorithm churns out and they deny it's machine learning and they, just, and they use the human in the loop thing, you know, that churns out discriminatory output. So this is all policy and this is all human decision making that's involved. And this is why I don't think this Tory government, sorry, Conservative government have got it right, because I don't think they're genuinely looking at it from that point of view. I couldn't agree more. But Marcus, Alison and I will keep talking at each other for an hour. So <laughs> sorry, keep, keep, keep us keep us going. I now that we're on the, the topic of AI, I have, I have an ethical question uh, for you both. And it'll be really interesting to hear your response. So we're using AI in a lot of ways that lots of people here will find surprising. So, for example, we, we are uh, 50,000 students in schools are, are using an AI tool which monitors their, their mood, uh, basically, through surveys. And the idea is that this can detect bullying, depression, and so on, enhance pastoral care. Um, and when you start to think about AI, and Alison just said that your your output depends on the quality of the data, right? So if you have better data, you have better outcomes. And when your outcomes are linked to direct saving of lives, like prevention of suicide, um, then it becomes very human to me. The question it, it kind of brings that away from just data protection and uh, puts it into kind of the real cost of uh, actually not having data, right? Because if you ask me personally, how much data would I give? I've had a, a good friend who committed suicide several years ago. Um, for example, how much data, personal data, I would give to have prevented that suicide, then it's not a question for me at all. There's absolutely, there's hardly anything I wouldn't give, right? Um, so then the question to policymakers is, does the state have a right to harvest data, especially forcibly harvest data, for example, medical data, NHS data, in order to save lives? And where, where is that boundary for you? <laughs> I'm going to let Alison answer this. She's more of an expert than I am on this. But I suppose the initial view I would give is that um, you, need, uh, you need the right frameworks in which you operate, right? Um, because to go to your example, and um, uh, let's use the school example, right? If you said to me as a parent, my kids aren't old enough to be at school yet, but if you said to me, uh, look, we're going to be able to personalize the education both of your, your girls have. And, um, uh, you know, if one's a bit behind on fractions and one's a bit ahead on French, then in a classroom of 30, we're going to make sure that we can accelerate them more quickly because of the way the education is personalized to them. Are you cool with that? I'd be like, that sounds great. You know, we should be doing that. But uh, the state has to be ensure that the kind of the regulatory box in which this happens sets the limits about what is okay and what is not okay. And what happens if stuff happens that's not okay, if that makes sense. Uh, and the state isn't very good at that. Um, and I don't think we have the enforcement capacity in place to deal with that in the right way. And Alison already mentioned, you know, the provision in GDPR and how it's been adopted into UK law where it says, you know, you can't make a, an important decision about someone in an entirely automated way without human intervention. And it just doesn't work in practice. And I, you know, I, I, I legislated this in Parliament as one of the opposition members on the bill committee and raised it. And everyone just seemed to kind of say, well, you know, it is what it is. And that's not good enough. So you've got to be able to set the framework around this. Otherwise, you're going to get carried away and you're going to have negative consequences. And ultimately, you want people to have trust in these systems in order to be able to adopt them and use them and to be able to gain those positive policy outcomes. Um, but we've got much, much more work to do to be able to, I think, do that in the in, in the right way. And, uh, and I don't think there's enough time being debated, uh, taken to debate these issues. But I say Alison's the expert on this, not, not me. Well, I mean, I'll just start from a regulation point of view before I discuss my absolute um, dismay about em emotive AI or emotion AI and, and, and other aspects of AI like that. And I'm, and I, I'm a, you know, I'm involved in developing algorithms. I'm in research things and I'm doing predictive algorithms. That's my background. So I'm not throwing it all out as bad. It's just how we do it. But we do need regulation. And, I, and, and there's been a lot of resistance 
with this government to actual regulation. There's been a lot of resistance from from um, the from industry to to regulate. They they say they want it, but only in their terms that they want it, and it gets watered and watered and watered down to it becomes meaningless. So it becomes just ethics washing, as we call it. Um, but we do need um, regulation, and we need a framework where people can be aware that they are subject to these algorithms and have a right to redress. And at the moment, they can't do that. They don't even know they're being impacted by these algorithms. So it is absolutely vital that we have regulation. There's been some good bills going around. Lily and Edwards did one about the coronavirus um, tracing apps. Um, there's the accountable um, um, AI Act that's been was being put forward a couple of times now in the states, which I've read through and it's actually very good. Um, but the UK, despite all the supposed interest, seems to be very resistant to these going through. We need a regulatory framework, absolutely, from a human, you know, from a human citizen point of view. With regards to this 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 trade off that we're being sold between our privacy and our freedoms. And this is the big battle. And this is, again, again the coronavirus tracing apps was about this. And nobody in their right mind would say, if, if it can save a life, have all my data. That is a fallacy. That is a false argument because you do not need all of the data to be able to do that. And actually, these systems, again, are not perfect. They're not accurate. So Emotion AI has real issues with it being um, distinct, dis address with gender, address with um, BAME communities and how they address that, cultural aspects, um, neuro neurodiversity aspects. So if you're trying to read an expression on a face, to try and take all of that in and have the algorithm learn that is actually really difficult. And they are not there yet. They are not good enough to be implemented. And so if you do not know the metrics of anything that you're subject to, your false positives and your false negatives and your accuracy rates for your, it's called disaggregating the data, for your subsection, then you should not be impacted by these. You should have a right to that knowledge. So if I'm having an... Um, uh, if I'm doing a recruitment tool, you know, if I've been going through recruitment and AI is sifting through my, my, my thing and has decided to give me an interview or not, I need to know that and I actually need to know what the metrics are and I need to know, well, is this been done so it's, you know, gender neutral or am I now seeing further, further um, injustices because you've trained it on what's the perfect CEO and we know all the CEOs are mainly male. So it's the values you put into it. So what looks like sad or angry or confused for a white male might be completely different for a female from a different culture. Um, and that AI needs to be trained on that. And they very often aren't because they don't and, have the data. And, and one thing I would add as well, um, and to give you another kind of live example, um, in my constituency, um, I've got two very large Amazon regional distribution centers. And um, in De I think it was December or January, um, a constituent was telling me how, uh, and I thought these were only in the US, but apparently they're now in the UK, they have to wear a kind of wristband um, on the shop floor. And it, it measures how quickly they kind of pick up parcels and move parcels around. And this guy was, um, I think he was in his early 60s. He wasn't yet old enough to get his pension. He'd been made redundant. Um, from his previous role and he was just kind of looking to you know have a job for a couple of years to time over until so he could claim his pension and uh in an entirely automated fashion this wristband um kept telling him that he wasn't being quick enough um and on the first occasion like a message came up saying that his i don't think it was called productivity there was this particular word it used and I, i've forgotten it now unfortunately but basically it said he wasn't quick enough and he had three goes and he had to improve his speed um, and the second time it then flashed up and said he wasn't being quick enough and he had to go and see his manager and the manager said to him, look, why are you not working quick enough? And the guy was like, well, look, I'm 62. <laughs> so I can only really work so quickly. And the manager said, well, there's nothing I can do about it. If you have a third productivity warning on your wristband, I'm afraid, you know, you can't work here anymore. Uh, and that didn't have human intervention, had no empathy, it had no line management or people management kind of um, approach, which is something that we you know, expect from good managers in good workplaces. It was just a wristband tracking his location and his speed at moving things, taking no different view to me doing it or a kind of 21 year old doing it or him as a 62 year old doing it. Uh, and apparently 
um, you know, the laws that we have in our country now allow that to happen. That seems to me to be another example where that kind of regulatory box of what's OK and what's not OK, mm. especially in workplaces where you're not allowed to be unionised and have union representation, um, you know, they, they need updating. Mm. And just because you can doesn't mean you should do these things. And actually, these things are also false economies, because yeah. if you think that you have a high turnover of staff, that's actually a cost implication. Um, also, if you do not treat your staff well, um, actually that reduces productivity. Um, so, you know, things like hot desking, for example, mm. that was a thing that actually reduces, you know, productivity and how you're treating. We're going backwards from this idea of treating your employees well and having that loyalty and that productivity to now just treating them as disposable assets. Um, yeah, and it's a false economy. Mm. So we're on the topic of regulation on AI. And it's very interesting because every time I talk to anybody interested in this, they all agree that we need uh, oversight. We need uh, the system. It could be better at the moment. So um, if, if you had the genie come to you and you made the wish, obviously, that you could be Secretary of State for Ethical AI tomorrow, what would your regulatory box look like? Start. That is, that is, I've been debating this and, and actually Darren might be better at this. I mean, it's because AI can be so sector specific is AI comes into all sectors. So do we use the existing regulatory bodies that we have and have AI as a, se a section of that? Um, or do we have a separate regulatory body, a little bit like the ICO, who I know would love to expand their remit into that in, into this field so they involve in data to to have that go-to body um is, is really really difficult um i th i think the so so that is for hu human redress but i think there's regulations that we can have um that will build in to make sure that these systems are correctly used and, and high risk this idea of algorithmic impact assessments are requirement for them high risk algorithms that impact on individuals that really genuinely has to be built into legislation a go no go thing much like you have um, bioethics and embryology um, boards who can actually say well no this can continue or this cannot continue um, just from a moral and ethical standpoint um, i think we need it with ai um, but there is a lot of resistance to that because everybody's like, they oh, it'll stifle innovation. Well, if you do it right, it should actually inspire innovation. Mm -hmm. So that the argument is old. Yeah. Mm. Materiality, yeah. So you asked an interesting question, Marcus, which if you were the Secretary of State for Ethical AI, uh, and the challenge I would put back to your question is about what do we, what do we actually think AI is? Uh, and AI, from my perspective, is is a general purpose technology, right? It's a bit like electricity or steam or whatever it might be, if you think about previous industrial revolutions. So you, it will apply in every single government department, it will apply in every single sector, as by the way, kind of data does, right? And so, uh, and increasingly cybersecurity and all of these issues. And so we often have a debate in, in parliament, you know, should data policy be in DCMS or should it be in the cabinet office or should it be in Bayes or should it be, you know, where should it be? And cybersecurity, I think there are like three or four ministers now that are responsible for different aspects of cybersecurity. And so then you say, well, where do you put the minister for artificial intelligence? And you think, well, gosh, they need to be everywhere. And so that then begs the question, well, what if you can't have that, what do you have instead? And I think there are, Liam, Liam Byrne gave a very good speech in the House when he was Shadow Digital Minister, um, putting forward his Digital Rights Bill. And he referred to the number of pieces of primary legislation that went through the House of Commons during the, the Industrial Revolution to deal with mechanisation and factory and kind of workers' rights and um, competition policy and tax policy and all of these issues. And we've not really had anything at all on AI as, a, as an equivalent general purpose technology. So if I had a kind of magic wand, I would like there to be a recognition that actually the way in which we have to adopt to the fourth industrial revolution has to be broadly like the way we adopted to the last one, i.e. it needs to be embedded in every single department and across every area of policy. And you need people that understand it and are working in the civil service and are in ministerial teams and number 10 gets this too and the treasury gets this too so that you can start to recognize the positive opportunities and we've talked about some of those 
but then also importantly recognizing how the functions of the state and policy and regulation and legislation has to fit around that so it's not just kind of one thing and it's not just one minister it's more of a recognition that it should be kind of embedded uh, alongside in my view um net zero transition there are some of these kind of horizontal issues that should be uh, assumed to be at the, at the center of every assessment of the policy not as a standalone issue and that begs the question that we need the unions to get really on board with this issue which i don't think they really are properly yet um one or two are but you know this is what we will what will drive that this much like it did in the last revolution Trade union modernization is, a, is is another topic for which I have very many views, but I, we probably don't have time to go into that today. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah. Do you think that talent is uh, an issue when, when it comes to regulation? Because, for example, we have the FCA, which is a world-leading world leading regulator, doing very well, leading on AI and things. And then we have, actually, we have, I think, over 100 regulators in the UK, uh, for very, very, some for very, very specific things. Um, and, you know, if we wanted to upskill all of them right now, would we have enough talent or, you know, uh, my personal view, if we had a central regulator, which works with all the other ones, um, to determine materiality and what materiality means in those specific sectors that they regulate, then that might be a better approach. But do you have any thoughts? So I don't know whether Alison and I will disagree on this. I'd be interested to hear what Alison has to say. I mean, so when it comes to the question of regulatory design, um, you know, you can talk about AI, you can talk about the internet economy, you can talk about data, and you often have this conversation about should there be a specialist function? Should you have people embedded in all the other regulators? How do you kind of construct this in a way for it to work well? And the example I always give as a kind of comparator is, is consumer law. So consumer law applies across the entire economy, right? It doesn't matter what you buy as a consumer, pretty much. Um, you know, if it's a good or a service, there are a few exceptions. But on the whole, consumer law applies, applies to you. Um, we have the Competition and Markets Authority, which is responsible for consu consumer law across the whole economy. But it's such a big and vast issue. They don't have the capacity to deal with individual cases or individual scenarios. They can only deal with kind of the quite kind of macro assessment of these issues. And then you have some regulated sectors um, who are very good and have great competency in consumer law, Ofcom and the telecommunications sector, something I worked in in the past, they're pretty good at that, right? Uh, you've then got other regulators, and we've seen this during the COVID pandemic, uh, the Civil Aviation Authority, pretty good at regulating civil aviation, doesn't really have the capacity or the number of people to deal with the demand in consumer law enforcement right now. And it's exactly the same conversation on, on this issue. Um, you can't, in my view, just have kind of one central function that has scope across the entire economy because they're never going to be big enough or have the capacity to do that. You've therefore got to make sure you have sufficient prioritization and, um, uh, and capacity across sectoral regulators. And if there are gaps where you all have a particular worry, then you need to make sure you fill that in, in, in some way. We, we it, it's been a nightmare and I cannot remember the name of it. So, so Darren, there is a, a group that's now being developed who are in the position of advising the various regulatory bodies on AI and digital aspects. The, um, yeah. the international one or the domestic one? Oh, the domestic do one. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's just set up last year. Not, 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 not the CDEI. The hope was that the CDEI would be this, but it, it's turned into a mini Turing Institute now, by my view, in my viewpoint. Office of Responsible AI. No, it's not no. even that. No, they're all <laughs> popping up all over the place. So yeah. we've got the AI Council, but that's really an industry yeah. focus yeah. thing, um, and and doesn't quite necessarily. And, and I, I know some of the people on that, and I have great respect for them, but it hasn't quite done what I hoped it would. We have the Office for AI, we have the CDI, but there is another one. It's not by Catherine Ross under the name. And it started in 2019. And their role is in a webinar. Can, I know, they're, they're all popping up everywhere. And her, their role, their remit was to, they all act as an advisory po, um, position to all the different regulators on AI. And I didn't know about this, and it's a good idea, but what worries me with some of this is that this was created, jobs were allocated, little bit like people in the know, and to, to and judge it like that, and it wasn't openly done, and people don't know it exists, yeah. unless you really dig down into it. And 
on face of it, it seems like a good idea. But again, I just think it's another quango if we're not careful. What is it? So it's the Regulatory Horizons Council. That's and, the it. And, the, and the reason I should have known that before checking is because I think it's a function of Bayes and therefore my committee has some oversight of it, I think. <laughs> I need to check, but yeah. Yeah, so, but do you see what I mean? I think if right. neither of us know about it, that's a problem. Very, very, yeah. Where's the accountability coming from, right? Where, where, where does that, how does it end up in the general public's hand? And the accountability comes right back to a central question that you asked about the difference between how, what role should the state have in yeah. this? Mm. And, you know, this, this, this offset between, so, yes, the state should absolutely have a role in it, provided the state is accountable. And at the moment, we're in a situation where the state is becoming less and less accountable by virtue of the way, you know, Brexit and, and the COVID crisis has allowed that to occur. Um, then it becomes a problem. So it should be the state have evolved. They should have a finger in this pie, but only as long as you can trust the state that you have. And that is that can change with times. OK, unfortunately, it's six o'clock. So uh, if... Uh... Uh, we, we, we got through a lot of topics. There's still so many more to cover, but it's been a fantastic discussion. Uh, thank you to both uh, Alison and Darren. Um, please stay engaged with us. I've posted in the chat links to both the Young Fabians and uh, the panelists and uh, um, Labour Digital. And uh, if there is... Um, if you want to see future events like this, please drop us a line and we'll do our very best to host another one uh, on this topic or on another topic. But uh, as, as Darren said, we, we could have just an hour speaking back and forth between you two and then we spend <laughs> another hour on something else and, and so on. So um, absolutely thank you everybody for attending, submitting your questions and um, for as Simon Johnson says, a great session, thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah, thank you again for, uh, for your time and hopefully see you next time. Thanks, Marcus. Nice to Have see you, Alison. Nice to see you too. Thanks, everybody.